Good morning. I'm Jan Cope, Provost to the Cathedral. And on behalf of our Bishop and Interim Dean, Marianne Edgar Buddy, and all of us who worship and serve here, it's my great privilege to welcome you to our service this morning. Those of you who are with us in the nave and those of you who are worshiping with us online. I'd like to extend a particular welcome to a visiting group from Taiwan, Vox Nativa Children's Choir. We are looking forward to more robust singing in our worship service this morning, so thank you for being with us. When you came in, you received a bulletin insert that has some announcements about upcoming things in the cathedral community. I commend those to you. There are just a few that I'd like to briefly mention um, before our service begins. One immediately following this service will be the third of a three-part series on the study of the Gospel of Mark. And that will take place in Perry Auditorium on the seventh floor of the cathedral. For those of you who've not seen it, also on the seventh floor of the cathedral is a contemporary stained glass art exhibition. Information about that is in your announcement sheet and we commend that to you. And then finally, our 20s and 30s group will be hosting their monthly Ultimate Sunday Brunch after this service and you can meet them in the refreshment area by the congregation table following the service. Now we invite you to a moment of silence to still yourselves for a time apart with God.
Blessed be our God. <coughs> Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Let your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend your church, and because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanity, says the teacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. I, the teacher, when king over Israel in Jerusalem, applied my mind to seek and to search out wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to human beings to be busy with. I saw all the deeds that are done under the sun and see all is vanity and a chasing after wind. I hated all my toil in which I had toiled under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to those who come after me and who knows whether they will be wise or foolish yet they will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned and gave my heart up to despair concerning all the toil of my labors under the sun, because sometimes one who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave all to be enjoyed by another who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What do mortals get from all the toil and strain with which they toil under the sun? For all their days are full of pain and their work is a vexation. Even at night, their minds do not rest. This also is vanity, the word of the Lord Degree and 
kind poor to a care there. My mouth shall speak of wisdom, and my heart shall A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Colossians. If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourselves with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free. But Christ is all and in all. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who sent me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, what should I do, for I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, I will do this. I'll pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, You have ample goods laid up for many years to come. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, amen. Good morning. It's a great blessing for me to be with you in this house of prayer for all people. My heart is filled with gratitude for all those of you and all who have gone before us whose generosity and support first built and now sustains this cathedral's life and its ministry to the nation and the world, and I give thanks for all who have come from places far and near who may be watching online to take part in this time of prayer and reflection on sacred texts and gathering around the table of Jesus. I take the place of this pulpit in our nation's spiritual and public life very seriously. And thus I've given considerable thought, wondering what I might say to you today in light of our sacred scriptures about the political conventions of the last two weeks and the issues before us as a nation. And I have no doubt that there are things to say. But I've come to the conclusion that, for today at least, a change of subject might be helpful. (laughs) or at least a change of perspective, a lens through which to see our place in the world and how best we might live the days we are given. Teach us, Lord, the psalmist said, to number our days that we might set our hearts to wisdom. So I'd like to begin with a story It's about a teenage boy who watches as his father's life becomes consumed with an overwhelming task. Setting is Brooklyn, 1945. The father has raised his son alone. The mother, his mother had died shortly before he was, shortly after he was born. 
And father and son had shared a good life, devout Jews in a tight-knit community of their neighborhood and their synagogue. And of course they had known suffering, real suffering, both personally and in light of the cataclysmic events of their day, most notably the war in Europe, the progress of which they followed closely in the newspapers and on the radio. And at last, the long-awaited news of Hitler's defeat comes. And for a short time, the boy and his father are euphoric and filled with relief at the war's end. But then, the ghastly reports of mass killings in Europe are confirmed. And with Jews throughout the world, the father and son are yet again overwhelmed by grief. And the father, as a university professor, decides that he, the Jewish people can no longer wait for their Messiah to come. They must take matters into their own hands, he tells his son. And he spends more and more time away from home now, dedicating his life to the establishment of a Jewish homeland. Now, he's always been constitutionally very frail, and he's clearly working himself to the point of collapse, and the son sees this and worries. And the father sees his son's concern and realizes that he's no longer a child. And so over a cup of tea one evening, he speaks from his heart and says to his son, human beings do not live forever. We live less than the time it takes to blink an eye if we measure our lives against eternity. So it may be asked, what value is there to one human life? There's so much pain in the world. What does it mean to have to suffer so much if our lives are nothing more than a blink of an eye? But I learned a long time ago, he said, that a blink of an eye in itself is nothing. But the eye that blinks, that is something. A span of life can be nothing. But the man who lives that life, he is something. And he can fill that tiny span with meaning. So its quality is immeasurable, though its quantity may be insignificant. But a man must work to fill his life with meaning. Meaning is not automatically given, and it's hard work. A life filled with meaning is worthy of rest, he said, and I want to be worthy of rest when I'm no longer here. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? And his son nodded. And it was the first time his father had spoken to him of his death. Now, if we all knew the moment, and if we all knew how close we were at any given time to that moment, when our lives are taken from us, it would be difficult to get out of bed in the morning, much less to go about the routines of our day. But Thankfully, most of us are spared from that knowledge, which affords us the ability to go about living. But then something can happen to remind us how precious and precarious our lives are. We might be among those caught up in the disaster of the day, that receives a flurry of attention until the next one strikes, and while the public's attention moves on, we remain forever changed. Or it could be something far more personal, you know, the unexpected diagnosis, the loss of a friend, a job, or a dream. Everything and anything can be taken from us in an instant. We all know this, but we can't really know it, can we, until it happens? And even then, the reality is too much to hold for long. And what can we possibly say 
in the face of the truth we all conspire to forget as we live. Reuven's father said, span of life is nothing, but the person who lives that life is something. We can fill our lives with meaning. And Jesus said, fascinatingly enough, just before telling a story about a man who had wasted his life, his precious life, he said, be on guard. Be on guard against all manner of greed. And it wasn't so much the fact that the man in the story built the barn so that he might enjoy the abundance of his crops. It wasn't that that made him foolish. It was his assumption that all that abundance was for him alone. It never occurred to him that he could share some of that bounty. Now, I dare say few of us think of ourselves as greedy people, and the same would be true of those who heard Jesus tell this story. They were his followers, not known for great wealth. But no matter how relative our wealth or poverty, it seems Jesus wants us to know that our lives are never defined by our possessions or lack of them. And greed in Jesus' mind isn't what we might associate with greed. Greed is simply the way our minds can get all bound up, fretting about what we have or want or envy, envy from others. Greed for Jesus is what causes us to value other people for what they can do for us rather than who we are. Greed for Jesus is what traps us into thinking that our worth, our reason for living is bound up in possessions and not only possessions but accomplishments and stature and appearance, which in themselves, none of which are necessarily bad, but held up as our highest priority, keep us focused on things that on the life scale of life's true meaning actually fall rather low. Anxiety, you know, serves to distract us in exactly the same way. Jesus could just as well have said, be on your guard against all manner of anxiety. For when we're anxious, we are also easily preoccupied. And like greed, anxiety keeps our focus on external things. And thus we are more easily manipulated by forces that would keep us small. Be on your guard, he said. Now, before going any further, I'd like to put in a good word, Jesus, for storing up crops in our barns. Because I know, as do you, that it's a good thing to be prepared for what we cannot foresee, for having reserves both personally and collectively, to draw upon in hard times, for being prepared with a plan, a protocol, and sufficient resources to share. We know this. We know that it isn't greed that moves us, for example, to manage our personal finances. That's prudence. That's self-care. And that's a form of love. For with stability, we can live well and still have margins upon which others can depend. It isn't greed, for example, that moves us to build strong communities and the structures that communities need to live well, schools and healthcare systems and streets and secure housing and churches. That, too, is a form of love, the most forward-thinking kind of love that anticipates needs 
and determines to meet them in advance, ensuring that one generation can take for granted what another sacrificed mightily to achieve. There's a difference between love and greed, between love and anxiety. And the difference is that what we have is that ready to be given away when needed. You fool, you fool the man. God says to the man who built his barn and your abundance wasn't just for you, it was for you to share. And now that your life is asked of you, others will have what you have collected. But what you missed, what you missed, dear man, was the joy of sharing, the joy of giving, the joy of seeing on another person's face their need met from your abundance. Who among us wants to face that end of life sorry that we didn't spend everything on ourselves? Who among us wants to be like that weary cynic whose words we heard from the book of Ecclesiastes, resentful of those who will receive his toil, the fruits of his toil after he's gone? Do any of us want to be that person? No. And the point of Jesus' parable is simply this. If you want to live well, be rich toward God. Put, put God first. And when we put God first, God in turn says to us, actually, put other people first. Always put other people first. Put them ahead of your possessions. Put them ahead of your accomplishments, ahead of even your personal comfort. Place your own soul, that priceless part of you, Place it first and hold it before the light of God and ask, what can I do with this blink of time that is mine? With what meaning can I fill this life? There are, in fact, so many ways to fill a life with meaning that only in God will we know which is ours which is our way, our path to walk. Only in God can we, can we know with some confidence what is ours to do and to become, no matter what others have around us or might be doing that would cause us to doubt ourselves. That's why Jesus encouraged us to be rich in God, so that God can help you and help me discern and know what is best for us, which meaning is ours to pursue, what we have to give and to share. And so I urge you this day, in the strongest possible terms, to make room in your life for God. Take time each day just a moment to sit quietly or take a walk or drive in silence and pay attention to what God is saying to you. Let God's grace fill you. Let God's love challenge and inspire you. Hold your life before the light and love of God. And remember that in the end, it'll pass away in the blink of an eye. In the end, no matter what you've accomplished or accumulated, that's not what's going to matter, but who you've become, the lives you've touched, the grace you've known, the love you've shared. In the end, you and I will give everything away. So why not, why don't we all start practicing now and get really good at giving from our abundance, giving it away? Others will benefit immeasurably. And God knows, so will we. Amen.
We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he suffered under Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead in the life of the world to come. Amen. Almighty God, you promise through your Son, Jesus Christ, to hear us when we pray in faith. In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray for the Church and for the world. God of grace and mercy, strengthen Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, the presiding bishop, Marian, our bishop, Randolph, dean elect of this cathedral, and all your church in the service of Christ, that those who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. God of grace and mercy, Bless and guide the people of this land. Give wisdom to all in authority. In the Cathedral Cycle of Prayer, we pray for the state of Georgia. Direct this and every nation in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and seek the common good. God of grace and mercy. Give grace to us, our families and friends, and to all her neighbors, that we may serve Christ in one another and love as he loves us. God of grace and mercy. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, spirit, or relationship. We pray for the continued healing of communities in our nation and around the world who are affected by acts of violence and terrorism, that love and compassion may overcome hate. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. God of grace and mercy, Hear us as we remember all who have died according to your promises. Grant us with them a share in your eternal kingdom. God of grace and mercy. Rejoicing in the fellowship of Peter and Paul, our patrons, and all your saints, we commend ourselves and the whole creation to your unfailing love. God of mercy and God of grace and mercy. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, 
ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. May Almighty God have mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace be with you. Once again, thank you for taking time in your day, in your lives, to gather in this place for prayer and community. We're so honored that you're here. Um, we pause now in the service to catch our breath and prepare ourselves to gather around the table of Jesus, which for Christians in this tradition is our primary act of Sunday worship when we say prayers and remember the way he gathered with his disciples on the last night of his life and shared a meal and assured them and us that whenever we did the same, he would be present with us. And on behalf of all of us here in the cathedral, I invite everyone in this cathedral who would like to take part to come forward after the prayers have been said to receive a bit of bread and a sip of wine. If you would prefer not to receive, but simply to be part of this service in your own way, we invite you to come forward nonetheless, and one of us would be happy to pray with you and offer a word of blessing. There is also time in this service, as the communion prayers are being offered, for individual prayers for healing. We have um, wonderful members of our community who know and love to pray with other people, and they will be waiting in the chapel here to my left, your right, War Memorial Chapel. And if you would like a bit of time, individual time, for healing prayers for yourself or someone you love, please know that there is someone waiting to offer that prayer with and for you. It is the custom of Christians when we gather in worship to take an offering of money as a reminder that everything we have belongs to God and those tokens of generosity remind us of our desire to give back. So that is what we will do here in short order. I want to assure those of you who are our guests that your presence here is more than gift enough but should you decide to make an offering, we thank you for that on behalf of all those who will benefit from it and promise to you our best intentions to steward your gifts with utmost prudence and love and faithfulness to the gospel of Christ. And in his name, I remind you all and remind myself that we continue now to walk in love, in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a gift to God.
Lord our God. It is truly right and good and joyful to give you thanks, O holy God, source of life and fountain of mercy. You have filled us and all creation with your blessing and fed us with your constant love. You have redeemed us in Jesus Christ and knit us into one body. Through your spirit, you replenish us and call us to fullness of life. Therefore, joining with angels and archangels and with the faithful of every generation, we lift our voices with all creation as we sing. You gave the world into our care, that we might be your faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we fail to honor your image in one another and in ourselves. We would not see your goodness in the world around us. And so we violated your creation, abused one another, and rejected your love. Yet you never cease to care for us, and you prepared the way of salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then, in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word, made mortal flesh in Jesus, born into the human family and dwelling among us. He revealed your glory, giving himself freely to death on a cross. He triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present unto you from your creation this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, may they be for us the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons, that with Peter and Paul, our patrons, and with all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever through Christ and with Christ and in Christ. 
In the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ lived, died, and rose for you. Feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
At this time in our service, we send forth the sacrament, which we have shared at this table as the body of Christ, to those in our community who are not able to be with us. In the name of God and this cathedral church, we send you forth bearing these holy gifts, that those to whom you may go may share with us in the communion of Christ's body and blood. We who are many are one body, because we all share one bread, one cup. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for restoring us in your image and nourishing us with spiritual food. Again, the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. Now send us forth a people, forgiven, healed, renewed, that we may proclaim your love to the world and continue in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. Our lives are so short, and we don't have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us along the way. So be quick to love. Make haste to be kind, and the God of compassion, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit will go with you. Amen.
to love and serve the Lord.